Welcome back to the Pandemic Baseball Book Club. I'm today's host, Dan Blewett, and I'll be interviewing Sam McDowell and Marty Gitlin, who collaborated on Sam's autobiography, The Saga of Sudden Sam. So if you haven't read this yet, highly recommend you pick it up. Um, Really good book, The Rise and Fall and Redemption of Sam McDowell. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm a former pro pitcher myself, not nearly to the caliber of Mr. McDowell here. Uh, I pitched six seasons in the independent leagues here in the U.S., and I'm the author of three baseball books, My most recent was released this year in February. It's called Clean Your Cleats. And it was sort of my perspective and life advice that I wanted to give back to young ballplayers. So Marty Gitlin is a freelance writer and author of numerous books. I mean, Marty, you have so many, too many to count, um, including many on pop culture. One really caught my eye, The Great American Serial Book, which I need (laughs) on my coffee table. I'm a Cinnamon Toast Crunch guy myself. Uh, And The Greatest Sitcoms of All Time. Seinfeld, come on, I'm sure that's in there. Um, and some of your recent works, uh, uh, Marty was uh, Ultimate Cleveland Indians Time Machine. Uh, you also wrote a book about NBA superstar Kyrie Irving. And of course, this book, uh, which is doing really, really well. You guys have a lot of publicity and uh, signings and tours going on now, The Saga of Sudden Sam. And then Sam McDowell, uh, our hero here, made his major league debut for the Indians uh, a week before his 19th birthday in 1961. He was the American League ERA leader in 1965 led the American League in strikeouts uh, five times and was a six-time All-Star. And at six foot five, throwing from the left side, he was known for his terrifying velocity, throwing in uh, the hundreds, really at a time when, I don't know, Sam, what do you think? The average pitcher was, I would guess, what, mid to upper 80s at best? Well, I think there were some in the low 90s uh, during the time that I pitched. I do know that uh, Sandy Kopex also was up there in the hundreds. Mm-hmm. when he pitched and then of course later on as you said Nolan Ryan and Randy Johnson uh came along yeah so I mean but just to think of this you threw like three standard deviations harder than the average major leaguer uh which is crazy which we'll get into but Sam welcome to the show Marty welcome to the show thank you thank good you. to be here yeah appreciate it um so let's start first with uh your nickname Sudden Sam which is explained in the book uh, probably you could figure out a little bit about why you were called that, but Sam, how did you get that name, uh, nickname Sudden Sam? Actually, my first wife gave it to me. <laughs> Actually, it was from my fastball. My very first game that I pitched was against the old Washington Senators, now Minnesota Twins. Uh, but during the game, uh, after the game was over with, they, uh, went up and interviewed Harmon Killebrew and Jim Lemon and asked them what they thought of this young teenager out there on the mound. And they said his fastball rise up there all of a sudden. And then from that point on, it was sudden Sam. And, and I guess there was a writer in Cleveland who was taking claim to it, which also is okay. Uh, I really don't care. But from that time on, everybody and their brother called me sudden Sam. It's a good, it's a good nickname for sure. And, and Marty, how did you two get connected? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I had just concluded, I had just finished writing that ultimate Cleveland Indians time machine book. And I was sitting around and I was thinking somebody should do a biography of sudden Sam, because I knew all about his career. I mean, I grew up watching him and I, I went, you know, covered baseball for a long time. And um, I knew of not only his greatness on the mound, but his uh, alcoholism and his recovery from it and how he became really the first baseball counselor uh, helping people with addictions and mental health issues and so forth. Um, And I just found it remarkable and I, no one had ever written really anything about it in book form. So I called the Indians and they gave me Sam's number and I, and Sam said to me, he said, what do you know? I've been thinking about doing an autobiography of my own life. He said, so I, I, he said, I'll tell you what, write a chapter of it and see if I like it. And he called my, I did. And he, he called my writing seductive, which I thought was an interesting <laughs> term, but it was very complimentary. And he said, go ahead. And uh, so I, I, you know, I, I wrote the entire autobiography, but, but it, it, we were really co-authors because he was in on every word. I mean, he, he wa- looked at every chapter after they were written, he made changes, he, he made suggestions, um, so it was a real collaborative effort and, um, and the, the rest is history. I mean, it's been 
the um, success of the book has just absolutely blown me away. I had no idea that we would be selling this many. And uh, the, the publisher, Roman Littlefield, actually had to order a second printing two days before the book was released officially, which is the first time that in the publisher's history that ever happened. So it's been just, yeah, it's been a, 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 my, it's been the best uh, ex professional experience of my life. Well, I really like the, uh, I really like the cover art. I'm a big, um, I do a lot of graphic design myself for my various endeavors on the web. And I really like your cover. It's understated, but it's got a nice feel to it. It's just like a, I really appreciate the color scheme and I'm pretty critical of book covers to be quite honest, but I really, really like yours. I think it's simple, tells the story. And I just, I, it's got like a combination of kind of like a little bit of modern feel, but also like a nice sort of vintagey feel to it. So I really like whoever designed your cover. I think it was wonderful. Plus well, Roman Littlefield and Sam, uh, if, if you don't mind, if you have a minute or so, Sam has kind of an interesting story about why he chose that particular image for the cover. If you take a very close look at that picture and most of the heartache that I had while pitching came from critics that didn't know what I was doing and didn't know what was going on. And I had two announcers that got on my case morning, noon, and night about the pitches I was throwing. They didn't know that Bernie Tebbets, Joe Ed, uh, my managers were calling my pitches, all of my pitches. I wasn't permitted any uh, say in my pitches. And yet I was held responsible for the pitches whenever they hit them out of the park or whatever it was. One of the uh, uh, biggest problems I had was the two announcers kept telling me I was throwing change-ups to individuals, uh, which I didn't really throw, uh, but they didn't know that, but that's what they kept saying. And of course, I started getting a rep reputation of throwing change-ups to everybody when I had a 103-mile-an-hour fastball. And if you take a very close look at my hand, it's a change I'm, holding, grip. I'm holding a change up grip. Yeah. And I did that on purpose. <laughs> uh, so, because of all the uh, critics. Yeah. So I, I want to get into that. That was one of the, uh, the uh, that was a, a mini saga within the book was your fight with uh, Tebbets and and the management, which went on for like, I couldn't believe how many years that went on that, yeah. you know, you were establishing yourself as a dominant major leaguer and they continued to refuse to give you any leeway to call your pitches. And I'm outspoken. Uh, you know, I do YouTube videos on the web and I try to help coaches and parents and kids. I'm outspoken about how much I hate pitch calling for young players. Like, you know, I'm a former pitcher myself. I don't call pitches for my 14 U teams back when I had my baseball Academy, I let them call every pitch because it's their career. Right. And so when I, I could really relate to how you felt and I just felt burned up listening to you as a, a major leaguer on TV, like you said, you, you're going to get accosted by the press, not, not the people who are calling your pitches behind the shadows. How did you deal with that? Uh, I mean, that, that must've just burned you up inside. Well, it did it. They, it didn't eat away at me in the beginning because they're major leaguers, they're former major leaguer, leaguers, Joe Adcock. Look how famous of a hitter he was, uh, and so on. And Bernie Tebbets, the great catcher, uh, formerly for Detroit and so on, and, and a big manager. So initially, I didn't say much. Uh, but what started to get my ire was continually I was being sent back to the major leagues because it wasn't working. But yet when I went to the minor leagues, there was no coach there to call my pitches. In fact, there was nobody that pitched uh, as my managers, okay, except one, Charlie Gassaway, uh, but he never called any pitches in deep ball uh, when there was a deep ball. And uh, I used to go to Bertie Tebbets over and over and say, why are you calling my pitches and why did you want me to do this and this? He would never answer me. He gave me a very sarcastic remark of, don't worry about it, son. He used to always say, he says, I'm going to make a star out of you. Just pat you on the head. And pat me on the head and then go about your way and then send me to the minor leagues when everything didn't work. Yeah. And then in the minor leagues, look at my record. 
I mean, the one time they sent me down to Salt Lake City in 62, I throw a no hitter and a one hitter. And so they bring me right back up after two weeks down there and said, the minor leagues aren't doing you any good. You need to be up here. So I come up to the big league, Birdie calls my pitches again. Doesn't work. So they send me back to the minor leagues. But I, I'm the success of the minor leagues. Why? And why can't I be at the major leagues? Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not a know-it-all. I know that the major leaguers are far different than minor leaguers. Mm -hmm. And I've seen the difference. Uh, also, in my second career as a counselor and a therapist in sports psychology for all the teams uh, that I worked for, I just couldn't figure out what was going on and continually asked Bertie Tepitz and never got an answer. And it remained that way for the four or five years until finally in 1964, in spring training, I pitched a game in Phoenix against the Giants and got killed. I mean, Orlando Cepeda hit a home run off me in center field against the hurricane and it's still going. <laughs> uh, and uh, they brought me to the office and said, Sam, that's not doing you any good up here. We're going to send you back to the minor leagues. And that's when I had it uh, with Gay Paul and Bernie Tebbets. And I said, enough is enough. I said, don't call me up. Leave me in the minor leagues. And they didn't know that I knew the rules. And the rules said that if they left me in the minor leagues, they would lose me. And I would be up with a free draft. So some other team would get me. And they couldn't hold on to me. So uh, I just told them, leave me alone. I'll be down there. And they said, don't be like that, you know. And Gabe Paul even told me one time over the phone, he was going to bury me in the minor leagues uh, with my attitude. And I said, I didn't care. Uh, went back to the minor leagues. And that was the year that I was 8-0. I had a no-hitter, four one-hitters. Had a earn run average of 0.45. I was averaging 14 strikeouts a game. And I'm 7-0. And Gabe Paul calls me and says, Sam, we're calling you up. And we want you to pitch against the Angels uh, tomorrow in Los Angeles. And I told Gabe, I said, is Bertie Tevitz going to call my pitches? He said, don't be like that. And I said, well, then don't bring me up if he's going to call my pitches. And he says, I'll bury you in the minor leagues, and he hangs up. So I continue on and go into to Hawaii, which was very nice because it's the first year that Hawaii was in the Pacific Coast Lake. And I never was in Hawaii, and I thought it was nice, you know, seeing all those grass skirts. <laughs> uh, which you don't see in L.A. too often, although I guess in San Francisco you do now. Uh, but in any event, uh, I went to Hawaii, and I pitched a one-hitter there. And so when I landed in San Diego, a phone call uh, rings, and it's Gabe Paul, and he said, okay, have it your way. I talked to Bertie. He's not going to call you pitches. Uh, he wants to see you take the red, the, uh, the red eye all night long into Washington and pitch against the Senators, which I did when I landed with no sleep and I won the game. And from that point on, I was a pitcher. Uh, but I will admit that uh, I do owe an awful lot to Alvin Dark and to uh, Jack Sanford, who uh, that year, because of all going on, they fired Bernie Tevitz and they hired Alvin Dark. And in spring training, Alvin Dark comes to me the very first week. And he said, Sam, I know the history of all the managers calling you pitches. He said, I'm not going to do that. He said, I know you've got to learn uh, on your own and have confidence in yourself. And he says, but I hired Jack Sanford, who can teach you the science of pitching, which obviously today is lost. But back then, you know, you spent 10, 12, eight years in the minor leagues trying to learn the science of pitching or hitting or fielding, whatever it is. And uh, Jack Sanford would sit on the bench. We would go over everything I did wrong the inning before and why, and who was coming up the, the next four hitters or five hitters. Uh, of course, that's a little funny joke because most hitters, most pitchers would go over the next three hitters because you want to only face three and that's it. But because I was so wild, we knew I was going to walk one or two or three or four. Uh, in a game, so we'd go over the next five hitters, six hitters, mm -hmm. and it was a tremendous help to me. 
I want to I want to make sure I have the the, the chronology is correct here, by the way, because um, Sam had a long career, you know, but but uh, the, when they fired Bertie Tabas in 66, uh, um, uh, they uh, hired he, there were a couple other managers before Alvin Dark. Alvin Dark came out in 68. Uh, Joey Adcock was the manager in 67, who was a former roommate of Sam when early on in his career. And and Joe was the manager in 67. And they hired Alvin Dark and and, and Sanford in '68, and that was when Sam really, um, you know, felt like he became a pitcher because they allowed him to to call his own pitches. Yeah, and that's a, a really interesting story because you were, you know, like the high, most highly touted recruit in the country. Obviously, they didn't have the amateur draft back then, so you just signed uh, with the Indians. But you know, you struck out two batters an inning, maybe a little bit more. Or, in high school, yeah, yeah more, over like was it two and a half batters per inning, and I think people take this for granted. Like you see these number one draft picks, and you know even today, fifty percent of first round draft picks don't spend one second in the major leagues, and people can't really appreciate when you throw a hundred as a high schooler, you just rip it for the middle of the plate, and they strike out, right? They just fall down in line like a like a stack of dominoes. And so to take you, you were in the, in the major leagues, a hair before your 19th birthday. I, I can't imagine how hard that transition was from just blowing a hundred past, you know, snot nosed kids to suddenly pitching to Mickey Mantle and Harmon Killebrew, you know, AKA the fat kid from the way it was, wasn't that his nickname they said in ball four. Um, but you're, you go from just blowing fastballs down the middle of the plate potentially and getting away with it to suddenly having to be much more fine and precise. And like you said, understand the science of pitching, just how hard is that transition, Sam? Well, to be quite frank with you, in my particular case coming up, I was in Never Never Land. I, I would say my first four, five, six years in the major leagues, I really and truly didn't understand where I was, what I was doing. I was just a kid having fun, very immature, uh, a lot of it had to do with the alcoholic personality and the disease of alcoholism, but uh, I just never really realized where I was. I mean, I would sit on the bench and see all these huge superstars out there on the field, but when it took my uh, turn to go on the mound and pitch, I just focused on what I had to do, what I was hoping to do. I knew we were on the team. I was on the team that was going to come in last every year because Gabe Ball spent, uh, you know, nickels like manhole covers. <laughs> and uh, uh, he wasn't going to do anything to get a winner. And we knew we'd leave in spring training. We're going to be in last place. We weren't stupid. I mean, you played professional ball. You knew what, it, uh, what was going on in the team. And you couldn't pull the uh, wool over our eyes. We understood, but I didn't want to be embarrassed. I didn't want to uh, lose. I had pride. And uh, so I just went out focusing on trying to do the best I could and then to hell with it. And uh, it was that way really and truly. Now remember, uh, during my uh, amateur career, I never once saw a baseball game because we didn't have TV back then. And I never sat and listened to the Pirates on the radio, even though I went to high school only two blocks away from Ford's Field. And I pitched batting practice uh, for the Pirates while I was in high school. But I never had time to watch a game or sit and listen because I was playing all other sports, football, basketball, baseball, tennis, and cross country. So I never had time uh, to sit and watch a football game, a baseball game, hockey game, whatever. So I really didn't realize all these big names. I had heard a few names. Like in Pittsburgh, you couldn't help but hear kids in high school talking about a Ralph Kiner uh, or a Dick Stewart, who they used to call, call Iron Hands uh, because it couldn't hold on to a ball. Uh, but all these great names. And in fact, when they were trying to recruit me and I was uh, back pitching, uh, batting practice for the Pirates, the opposing team would also bring up their superstars to try and influence me, knowing that I was going to graduate in a year or two. So they would bring over gay guys like Hank Aaron or uh, Lou Burdett or Warren Spawn. 
and so on and introduce them to me. And I, as great as they were, I recognized St. Aaron, but I didn't recognize the other names. You know, and you're talking about Hall of Famers. Yeah. So I was just a never, never land. Real quick story about um, uh, his high school days and beyond. Um, Sam, you know, and this was unheard of back then to get this kind of publicity or attention, but Sam actually announced his decision to sign with the Indians on national television in 1960. Um, he was invited onto a game show that's actually back on the air now called To Tell the Truth. And, uh, you know, he was, there were two imposters and Sam, and they talked about, you know, his uh, 40 no hitters in high school and, and the, and the, and the uh, amateur level. And, and then they said, well, the police Sam was Sam McDowell, please stand up. And he did. And he, uh, that was when he announced uh, after the game, he announced that he had signed with the Indians. Um, and you can see it on YouTube. It's funny. I, you can find anything on YouTube. And if you look up Sam McDowell to tell the truth, uh, you'll see that episode. He's in the second half of that episode of, of To Tell the Truth. And uh, and that just goes to show uh, what kind of uh, an outrageous amateur career he had that, that he actually was invited to announce his decision where he signed on national television. Yeah. And Sam, I mean, you said you're in this fog and you're obviously such a highly touted high school prospect. And then you hit the ground running after some, you know, some rough patches, certainly in the major leagues. But you know, you establish yourself, you know, after what a handful of years and you were pitching well, um, how, why do you feel like you never really were present for all of your accomplishments and the hoopla about you? Why do you feel like you say you were in that self-described fog? Well, to get technical, uh, basically it has to deal with what's called an alcoholic personality. And what it is, is, uh, well, to explain it factually, your frontal lobe of the brain, they found out for most alcoholics, because it is a genetic disease uh, passed down from generation to generation, that basically your frontal lobe of the brain is asleep and it's not actually sensitive to the realities of what was going on. And you'll find that with every alcoholic. Now, it doesn't mean you're not aware of some stuff, but you're not as sensitive uh, to the realities of the particular day. And that's the way it was throughout my entire career. And so let, let's start to chat a little bit about that, because obviously in the book, there's a, a ton about your baseball career, but uh, there's the dark side of your baseball career, which was your alcoholism and you trying to sort of keep the wheels on, right? Like you talk about how, yeah, you get, plastered drunk and be in bar fights and get arrested and, um, you know, your suicide attempt and all the, the personal, um, just the personal trauma, I guess, but also you were able to sort of sober up before the days that you started. So how did you, as you realized that you were sort of slipping, um, what kind of things did you do to try to keep the wheels on and, and not fall out of the major leagues, which, you know, eventually happened after, but again, you had a very, very, very long career, so it wasn't really cut tremendously short. Um, but how did you try to keep a handle on things when you realized that maybe you were a little bit out of control? Well, uh, first of all, I, I, I'm not necessarily sure that I can say throughout any part of my career that I was really out of control, even though anybody around would obviously see it. Mm -hmm. But because of the denial process that goes on uh, with an alcoholic, we don't realize it. And I had everybody and their brother calling me a drunk and tell me I had a problem. But understanding that I was a fully functional alcoholic throughout most of my baseball career up until the last year or two. Uh, and that would be because I was a starter that started every fourth day that the day that I pitched that night after the game, I would go out and get drunk. Then the next day, I would come to the ballpark, I'd work my ass off, thinking I could sweat it out and I'd be perfectly okay. I'd even go in the whirlpool, you know, for a half an hour afterwards with that hot water, thinking that would help me out. It did, it got rid of a lot of the pain, 
Then, as you know, from a picture you had the next day. Uh, and then that night, I would also go out and get drunk. Then for the next two days and nights, I would do nothing but eat the right thing, drink the right thing, no alcohol, you know, uh, nothing, thinking that now when I take the mound, that I was in perfect spirits, perfect condition, what have you. It wasn't until years after when I went back to school that I started to realize that I really, it still was affecting me on the mound uh, by way of at least my thinking uh, on the mound, uh, which was part of the problem. Uh, but I still thought that I was okay because I pitched well. Obviously, my record. Could I have done better? Sure. Had I not been an alcoholic. Uh, how good? Who knows? Uh, I don't look back on that. Uh, I don't really resent anything that happened uh, in the past because I wouldn't have been where I was later on in life. But my last year with the Yankees and then my year with the Pirates, I knew something was wrong. I would never accept that it was alcoholism because I thought that that's the way a superstar is. We go out and get drunk, we get into fights, and that's just part of being star, you know, that type of uh, audacious thinking. Uh, and in fact, even when I realized enough is enough, that I can't control this, I can't handle it. I don't even know when I'm going to get drunk, which I used to do, but in the last couple of years, no, it was uncontrollable. There were days that I was in the car driving home saying that I'm going to go home, get dinner, and I'm not going to stop and drink. And halfway through, I'd pull into a bar. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, well, just one, right? Uh, just yeah. one. Yeah. Then two, then three. Well, what's the use? I'm drunk now, so continue mm -hmm. on. You know, that type of stuff. Uh, but even when I went to the rehabilitation center in Pittsburgh, I still thought that I wasn't a drunk. I thought that I had a mental illness because I had heard down the road. You know, back in that day, back in the 60s, they still thought that it was some sort of a weakness or a character flaw or some mental illness. So that's what I thought it was. So I thought I was mentally ill. But then in the rehab, when they sat down and they educated all of us that to exactly what it was, that it is a disease and so on, to me, it opened the gates. It just opened everything up because... I was paranoid with the fact that I thought I was mentally ill, and I wasn't. Well, and it, and it doesn't it didn't surprise me where you ended up because there are bread cr bread crumbs along the way in your story. Uh, again, a lot like one of my favorite books is Ball Four. There's a lot of similarities b between you and Jim. You both are sort of like free spirits and like deeper thinkers, and you mentioned this. Um, when you started to learn the science of pitching, how like you could tell like this was a really big passion of yours, and you started to learn about the psychology, uh, you know, sports psychologist, the psychology of controlling your mind in general on the mound, and so you start to see that part of you develop in the book. Where yeah, you have this side like you go out and get drunk, but there's also this very thoughtful, analytical um, side of you that has this passion for psychology. You know, do you feel like all the the sports psych that you were doing? on the mound in your career, like that, that sort of started to lead you into um, the psychology of addiction and all that afterward? I would have to say partially, yes. I keep saying that I was coerced into going back to school and becoming a therapist. Uh, and to some degree I was, mm -hmm. and I'll finish that in a second. But uh, throughout my entire career, I made enough money in the wintertime. I didn't have to work anymore after my first uh, three years in the big leagues back in those days. Remember, I made $6,000 in the major leagues. That was my entire salary for the year, uh, for the first three years in the major leagues. That was minimum salary. So in the wintertime, I had to work, which I did, uh, in a steel mill, another time in a gun shop, and so on. Uh, but when that was over with, I was making enough, I went back to school and took coursework in psychology and that sports psychology, mm -hmm. not because I was an alcoholic or wanted to figure it out, but I knew something was wrong. I couldn't figure it out, but I knew something was wrong. 
So I figured I would go back to school and, and learn and try and learn. What the heck is going on with me? Why? What's wrong? And I took course after course after course. And then once I went through my own recovery, I had a mentor who was a uh, ordained rabbi and a psychiatrist. And he was my mentor. And he's the one who coerced me into going back to school to take this course, take that course, take this course, because he knew my background. He knew how many credits I had in psychology and sports psychology. And he kept asking me and I kept telling him, I said, I see your therapist, none of them make any money. And I said, that's not for me. I said, I want to make some money in a second career. And I had already had all my licenses, whether it be for real estate, for insurance, for investigator, uh, for securities, uh, financial advisor, and so on. I had every single one of the licenses you could imagine in an attempt to prepare myself for a second career. And so that's where I thought I was going. But he kept having me go look at this book or go study this book or take this course from Harvard Medical School or take this course from San Diego Medical School and so on. So that's what I did. And so obviously he started laughing with me one day when I went in because I started my own practice with kids, helping kids that were in trouble. Uh, not necessarily baseball wise, but just simple kids that were in trouble. And he said, they're not coming to me, Sam. They're coming to you. He says, haven't you figured it out yet? And he started laughing and I laughed. And so I just finished up and went on to get my license and so on. A uh, real quick story, and I'll let Sam get to it. But um, uh, in the 1970, the Indians had a very unpopular uh, radio announcer named Bob Neal. Who uh, and um, he uh, actually said he he said that Sam has a million dollar arm and a ten cent head. Mm -hmm. and he failed for a couple times to win his twentieth game, um, and um, I'll never forget that. And here, you know, was a guy that didn't, you know, he was an Indians radio announcer, yet he had no idea or no understanding about what Sam was going through. Um, and and uh, all these people were saying, why don't you just blow a fastball by Ray Euler or Tom Matchick or whoever it was and, and, and be on with it. And Sam understood that even, you know, weaker and MLB hitters, you can't just blow away with fastballs time yeah. and time and time again, it just didn't work. And he understood that, but um, you know, Sam only won 20 games once, but, but he would have won if the Indians had any given him any hitting support whatsoever throughout his career. He would have won 20 uh, several times. In fact, in 1968, the year of the pitcher, he had a better ERA than 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 Denny McLean, who won 31 games. Sam went 15 and 14 that year with a 1.81 ERA, which is crazy. You know how little run support he got. But anyway, I don't mean to digress. I'm just saying that uh, there was a, there's a lot back then and today that's kind of misunderstood about Sam's career. You had the million dollar arm, but like I said, as I read the book, it was clear that you did not have a 10 cent head. You had a very thoughtful mind for psychology and for trying to learn the game. You know, you're very mischaracterized by that announcer and others. I was for many years, you know, but there's nothing you could do about it. You know, mm -hmm. as you know, I, uh, I was the clinical director for BAT, a program that I helped design for Major League Baseball to take care of former ball players that had difficulties, whether it be financial, psychological, emotional, uh, medical, whatever it was, mm -hmm. it was my job to find out what the problem was and then help find a solution for them. And one of the things that uh, really always caused me some serious consternation was, uh, especially with the minor league ball player, was that there were so many of them that when they quit baseball, they assumed uh, that they could just give lessons for kids, uh, pitching, hitting, whatever it was, and that's how they're going to make a living. And they found out in a very short order that they're starving to death, and a lot of them were married, had a child or two, and uh, Bat had to step in to help them financially uh, and to get them to understand you're not going to make a living. You know, very few have ever done that. Now, yes, have some done it? Yes. I know that Reggie Smith, a personal friend out in California, he had the most amazing academies out there in Compton, California, 
but he also spent close to a million dollars of his own money getting started. Mm -hmm. Well, your minor league player doesn't have that million dollars to help him get started. You know, he needs to get help from other people, what have you. And it's so tragic to see so many players out there that are starving to death, uh, thinking that somehow, some way, that that's the only thing they know, and therefore that's the only thing they can do. They shortchange themselves so much, uh, not understanding they could be a success in almost anything. Because being a professional athlete, you have, first of all, the discipline. Mm -hmm. You have also the mental acuity to figure things out. You have to, or you wouldn't be a professional baseball player. In fact, that's one of the major differences between an amateur and a professional no matter what a minor league or major league, okay, is you can figure a lot of these things out and you have the discipline, you have the, the willpower. Uh, but it's, it's sad they truly believe that's the only thing they can do. Now, your modern day ball player is making millions of dollars. And so when he retires or is thrown out of the game, he can sit back and relax with his millions and start new businesses or whatever he wants. Yeah. I understand that, but not the minor league ball player who never made money. Mm -hmm. You know, that is the biggest tragedy, I think. Yeah, and of course, you know, a lot of people forget that it's so hard to make it to free agency in the major leagues. You know, six years of, you need six years of service time, <laughs> which is, you know, nine seasons for a lot of players, 10 seasons, you know, half a year of one season, half a year of another uh, you know, 40 games of another season. It's so rare that someone actually gets to that contract year. And I, you know, playing in the independent leagues, I had lots of teammates who played in the major leagues for half a season, three seasons, two seasons, yeah. and they're not set for life. You know, maybe they got a couple hundred thousand dollars banked or they, they bought a house and that's great, but they still have the phase two of life and all the uncertainty that comes with it where they're like, well, I'm 34 and this is the only thing I've ever known. Am I going to get an entry level job? And they feel really lost. I felt really lost for, I mean, yeah. I'm at the tail end. I'm five years after my retirement now. And I still am just now kind of like hitting my stride, I feel. And part of it's just like, you know, you did this thing for 20 years and then you just one day you're just locked out and it's like extremely abrupt. I, I, did you see lots of players turn to substance abuse to help them cope with that, Sam? Well, it wasn't because of that, but yes, uh, only because they had already been involved, heavily involved with either drugs or alcohol. And I will say this, that uh, I was fortunate enough to be in baseball for the past 50 years, uh, both as a player, then as a counselor and a therapist. And I could see the changes that were going on back in our day. Everybody in the clubhouse smoked. Everybody in the clubhouse drank, okay? Your modern day ball player, that's not true. In fact, I go in the clubhouse now, which I still do because I speak to all of them in spring training uh, about that and what have you. And almost nobody smokes and very few drink uh, and very few take drugs anymore. And I would say that is because of a lot of the mistakes that the hierarchy made. Way back in the day, they assumed that by punishing a ball player that that was going to teach him a lesson. Mm -hmm. punishing you know, an individual that's got a disease that ain't going to help anybody and it took probably 10 to 12 years of people who were in the know knew what they were talking about me being one of them but just a minor voice proving to them that that's not how you help somebody and fortunately we were successful enough with Texas, Toronto Cincinnati, Pittsburgh uh, and the pirates that they visibly saw the changes that were going on with players that had an alcohol problem, had a drug problem, had a mental problem, had an emotional problem. They were able to see the changes that could be made through education and therapies instead of punishment. And it saved a lot of careers. And it also is saving a lot of careers today because every team has an EAP. I was the first EAP in the history of sports. Uh, there's a lot of them now that have a very good EAP. Most teams have a sports psychologist. Can you explain that that acronym for those who don't know it? Okay, it's Employee Assistance Professional. Gotcha, and what's it's your a, main job doing that? My main job now? 
Well, with with it, what's the main like roles oh. and duties of an EAP? Just for those who okay. don't know. Okay, well, it's to seek out those individuals that have problems, or to let the individual seek you out, and to confidentially, without the team knowing it, help that individual by finding a solution for whatever the problem is. And it could be anything, as I said, you know, alcohol, drugs, emotional problems, mental problems, uh, you know, anger management, and so on. But you find that solution for them. And the team don't know what you did or how you did it, but they physically, because of the way every human being that's got a uniform is viewed 24 hours a day by maybe 20, 30 eyes on that team, mainly to see if they got a way to help them become a better player, uh, become more productive, and so on. But because they're viewing that human being, they're seeing the changes that are taking place. And they're in awe of it. I remember Tom Greve, the general manager of Texas. He came to me one day about three years after I left. And he told me uh, right to my face and sent a letter saying that he never realized the total changes that can come about with individuals that were in trouble uh, in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. that he saw it over and over and over. And in fact, I got a letter from the vice president of the Toronto Blue Jays when we won the World Series. And he sent me not only a World Series ring, but he sent me a letter stating that I had as much to do with helping them win the World Series as the players did. And to me, that was awesome. Uh, and I never knew they knew what I was doing because the programs were always confidential. Nobody in management knew what I was doing. Yeah, you know, a, real, a quick story about that, um, the piggyback off of that in uh, right after uh, Sam began his recovery in 1980, around 1981, 1982, Bowie Kuhn, who was the commissioner of baseball, asked him to design a program. The villain from ball four. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. There you go. Uh, yeah. And I'm glad you didn't take it personally. I don't know if you know about his follow up book. But anyway, um, uh, he asked Sam to design a program uh, to help players with, you know, budding or, or existing addictions. And um, he, Sam did. But mm -hmm. of course, the addictions that he was working with was alcoholism as well as drugs. And Bowie Kuhn rejected that uh, proposal because the baseball had been so tied, uh, you know, advertising and so forth with with beer companies, Anheuser-Busch and Miller and so forth. That, that he didn't like that kind of connection. Um, but fortunately, the individual teams like Texas and Toronto eventually uh, ended up contacting him to, ha to help uh, players with emotional issues and addictions and so forth. But, but originally, the, the proposal that, that Sam designed to help people uh, was rejected by, by Bowie Kuhn because of the um, connections to, you know, alcohol. So... In, 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 and in fact, it was that program yeah. that I had designed that Bowie Kuhn apparently sent around to all the general managers and everybody rejected it except the Texas Rangers. Mike Stone, who was the chairman of the board of the Texas Rangers, and he knew everything I was saying, which kind of shocked me. But with his background, he had a degree in psychology, he had his master's in business. He was also an attorney. And his wife was a therapist for 35 years working with in the addiction field. So when I sent that program through and he read it, he said he wanted it. And I initially tried to talk him out of it because I wasn't making any great amounts of money. And I didn't want to waste my money flying to Texas only to have him say, we don't want you to address alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was kind of interesting. Yeah, and it's it's weird how these drugs are put in different classes. I read a book recently by Dr. Carl Hart. It's called Drug Use for Grownups. And he talks about decriminalization, all these different things. But one of the things he says is, is like, why are we putting, you know, alcohol in a completely separate okay? Like this is okay, but yet drug A, drug B, drug C, these are things a person should never touch. He's like, they're all just as bad. Like alcohol's ruined way more lives than, you know, this drug or that drug. Um, and I'm not advocating for any different drugs, but he just he he tries to contextualize the fact that 
alcohol is not this safe thing. Like everyone is allowed to drink it in the, in the U S and all over the world, but like, it's not safer than other types of drugs, you know, but it's just, it's, it's a weird how, you know, whether it's policy, whether it's uh, just the law or just public perception, there are different levels of acceptance for just different substances, but all of them can have really tragic consequences on your own life and the lives of people around you. Ultimately they can. Uh, but with the individuals that do advocate that they want everything legalized, an individual doesn't pick up a drink in order to get stoned. But an individual does pick up a drug in order to get stoned, uh, to change their feelings, to mm -hmm. change their thinking. Okay, that's the major difference that begins right there. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you, Sam. Do you see this sort of, is there like a, an effect of classism and a, I think I know the answer, but we know that in the minor leagues, especially there's bonus babies have been given a lot of money, you know, first round, second round draft, round draft picks at the major league club drafted them, gave them a million dollars, $3 million, $5 million. They get a lot more chances to fail uh, both on the field and off the field before they get out of there. And then there's players who, you know, went either, you know, free agent sign or they got 5,000 bucks as a senior or whatever. Um, when you talk about counseling, and you talk about performance, do you see that players who maybe have substance issues, who have a lot of money invested in them, like a first round draft pick who got $5 million, they're gonna give him a chance to go to rehab and spend a lot more time away from the field fixing his problems than someone who maybe only got no money invested in him or $10,000 invested in him. Do you see this difference in like the way players are treated based on sort of like their sort of class status and how much money is invested in them? 100%. 100%. In fact, my son is a perfect example. My son was signed for $500 out of uh, when he graduated uh, college. And he was signed with the Pirates. And he led the pitching staff in, well, back there was low A uh, and A ball, and then high A ball. Each one of the four years, he led the pitching staff. And yet, when he was about to move up to double A or triple A, they pulled him into the office and told him that they were going to send him back to Salem, high A, uh, even though he had earned his way into double uh, A, because they had three or four of their major bonus players who they're going to give a final chance. This is their statement. They're mm -hmm. going to give a final chance to see if they can cut it or not in, in uh, Harrisburg, their double A team, and send my son back to Salem again. And that's when my son said, see you later. I'm not going to put up with his bullshit. And mm -hmm. he didn't. And he showed me the courage. You know, he may or may not have made it. I don't know. Nobody will ever know. But he chose not to go through that bullshit, as I said. Uh, and all the ones that they sent up to Harrisburg, the following year, they were out of baseball and gone. <clears throat> but these were some of the bonus players that had been in the minor leagues five, six, seven, eight years, and have done relatively nothing. And in my 50 years of baseball, to me, I think that's one of the biggest tragedies, and I don't think anybody could ever change it. Yeah. Because you have the scouts that scouted them that you have to patronize. You have the general manager that now has to rely on the scouts and what they say and also, they have to patronize the scouts from the general manager's point of view. And I have seen player after player after player in the minor leagues that have a lot of talent, were not signed at any big bonus, and therefore had nobody in their corner yeah. fighting, fighting for them like an agent or like a, you know, a, 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 a general manager or a scout that signed them and get looked over and passed by. And one of the reasons why I always liked independent ball is you see some of these players who eventually do make it to the major leagues. It's very few and far between, I know. Mm -hmm. And because age is also ultimately against them, you know, they may have spent four years in the minor leagues, then go to independent ball, spend three or four years there. And by that time, they've got eight years in professional ball and to a scout that's too old. Yep. You know, unless you've got a 110 mile an hour fastball or you're hitting 30 home runs a year, 
or what have you. And I see that over and over every year, and there's just no solution to it. Well, did you see that the same structure happen with getting players help? So if I got a million dollars invested in me and the next guy got 10,000 invested in him, is the team more likely to get me addiction help or me mental health services than the guy who has less money invested in him? Do you still see that same sort of classist thing with taking care of players in the minors? No, they still release the players that they really don't care that much about. They simply release them because they now have an excuse and they simply use the uh, statement uh, that they just don't have it anymore. That has nothing to do with addiction or nothing to do with his mental problem or his anger management problem or well, whatever it is. Uh, I can't say that for everybody. I have seen occasions. I do know that in fact, with the Toronto Blue Jays and with the Texas Rangers, they were willing to help that player no matter what, even if he had no talent left, he had nothing left, they were willing to help that player. Give you a perfect, let me give you a perfect example. Uh, there was a minor league ball player that spent four years. Uh, eventually, it was found out that he had an emotional problem and they were going to release him. But they came to me and said, Sam, we can't afford to pay you know, for him anymore, what your thoughts are. And I said, to be honest with you, he needs help. And the general manager, Don Grease said, let's get it for him. Let's do that. And for the next three years, the Texas Rangers, even though he was not a member of the Texas Rangers, they paid for his therapy and for help. And he became a very productive citizen eventually. The same thing, when George Bush, the former president, owned the Texas Rangers, there was an incident, you may remember, everybody's heard about it in the newspapers where there was a guard up in the upper deck in the Texas Stadium in Arlington who was standing guard there and a man and a woman were drinking too much and they fell over the railing. And the one individual was killed, the other one was injured severely. Uh, okay, the Texas Rangers stepped in to help those individuals every way possible. But the guard was not an employee of the Texas Rangers, but the guard, because it happened on his watch, and he came to the Texas Rangers for help because he couldn't handle it anymore. And it was PTSD, actually, mm -hmm. uh, because he thought somehow he could have saved them, which he couldn't, but he thought in his mind he could have, okay? And it was brought to, uh, at that time, George Bush was a president of the Texas Rangers. It was brought to his attention because I'm the one in the meeting that brought it up that he needed severe help. And because he wasn't a member of the Rangers, their insurance wasn't willing to pay for it. George Butch immediately said, we will help him no matter how much it costs. And they stepped forward and helped that young man. And to me, it was stuff like that because I knew baseball and I knew one, this was above board. This mm -hmm. was over in abundance of whatever they needed to do. And very few teams would have done that. But both in Toronto and Pittsburgh were willing. They really believed in the human being. Yeah, that's impressive. Well, Sam, we can tell you have such a passion for this and for helping people. And you've obviously been a great force for good in baseball, which I think everyone appreciates. Um, Martin, what are some final uh, thoughts about the book and what are some of your final takeaways as, you know, the man who helped uh, get this out to, to publication? I think that um, the experience of, of working with Sam on the book um, was incredible for me. Um, but I think just getting to know Sam as a person since this has happened and all the publicity we've done and all the places we've gone to, to do book signings and things like that have been uh, have been um, maybe just as as um, something that I'll, I'll I'll embrace forever, and um, you know it's 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 it kind of still freaks me out to remember. You know, I used to go to uh, Cleveland Stadium to watch Sam pitch, and and I remember I'd show up early when Sam pitched because there was that he would not like let up at all on his on his warm up pitches like forty five minutes before the game, and you could hear that thud 
and then a catcher's mitt of 100 mile an hour fastballs reverberating around Cleveland Stadium. And I'll always remember that, you know, he was my favorite uh, pitcher to watch. And uh, and now here I am. And I, I couldn't have imagined when I was a child, you know, having done this, we're, you know, uh, co-authoring his autobiography. It's 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 yeah. uh, it's so surreal for me but it's been just great. I mean, I've just, I've just absolutely loved it. And and we're just kind of in a way getting started because we have a lot more to do to, um, to, you know, to publicize and, and market the book. And, and um, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's uh, called the rise and fall or the saga of sudden Sam, the rise and fall and redemption of Sam McDowell. It's on Amazon. And a lot of people don't know uh, interestingly that the character on cheers, Sam alone. Yeah. Good factoid. Uh, was was based on Sam McDowell. So a that's sitcom the guy would love that loves that factoid. Yeah, that's right. I yeah, <laughs> I, I I have Cheers number six in my greatest sitcoms of all time ranked. Uh, I have you mentioned Seinfeld, by the way. I did rank Seinfeld number one. I think to be quite frank with you, Marty, now that you know me, we got to change it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. It has to be Cheers now. I Cheers have Seinf number Seinfeld yeah. number one and All in the Family number two and Mash and I Love Lucy, Mary Tyler Moore Show, then Cheers. Those were my top six, but anyway, um, it's just been, it's been a whirlwind and it's been an incredible ride and, and uh, just, I, I've, I've just loved it. I've just loved it. I, I can't say enough. And Sam, what has it meant to you getting your story out? Well, um, to be quite frank with you, I'm not sure it's in the book or not, but uh, for the past, I'm going to say 30 to 40 years, I've wanted to write a book and I wanted to write a book my way that would help somebody. Uh, I could very easily write what I call a trash book in which it would be nothing but sensationalism, you know, going through all the bullshit that I went through and what have you. I come up with all kinds of stories that are going to sell a book, but I didn't want that. And I've talked with nine or 10 former writers or current writers that wanted to write a book with me that go clean back to Jim Murray uh, from the Los Angeles Times uh, back in the 80s that wanted to do a book. Uh, with me. And I respected that writer very much, but they all wanted to sensationalize a book. And to me, I wanted to just help somebody. And I've written three or four different scripts for it. In fact, that's how me and Marty got started was I wrote, I think it was two or three chapters and sent it to Marty and said, now, let me see what you could do with it. And that's what sold me is the way he wrote. Well, it's a great book, and I definitely recommend everyone jump out and uh, grab a copy. I'm lucky to have one of the few before you guys had to go to a second printing. So thanks for the for sending me mine. And like I said, I love the the cover design and really tells a great story. And that little factoid about the change up, which I can see you're palming there. Um, you know, just a, like you said, a nod to your development also as a, as a pitcher, learning to be not just this guy that blew 104 past you. So Sam, Martin, thank you so much for joining me on the show and uh, for being here for this uh, episode of the Pandemic Baseball Book Club. Thank you. Thank you, and I enjoyed very much you, Dan. Yeah, your, uh, your knowledge and, and your experiences in baseball really uh, uh, brought out a lot to this interview, and I appreciate that. All right, well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Pandemic Baseball Book Club. So as always, you can find links to buy the book in the description below, whether you're listening in podcast land or watching on YouTube. Sudden Sam is a great story, and obviously you can tell how much passion uh, Sam McDowell has for helping other people and how much passion Marty Gitlin has for helping him get his story out and their work together. So thanks, Sam, for listening, and we'll see you here next week on the Pandemic Baseball Book Club.